Good day and welcome to the CIM's Indigenous webinar series brought to you by the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Today we will be talking with Lana Eagle and Kathleen Cislack about gaining a new perspective, Indigenous Peoples of Canada. My name is Cassandra Spence and on behalf of the CIM I want to thank you for joining us today for the first in this series of webinars focused on the relationship between Indigenous peoples and the mining industry. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining the call from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. There is a handout available with information on today's speakers and the webinar series, which you can access from the control panel. But first, some housekeeping before we get started. If you joined with your computer audio, make sure you select the computer audio button on your control panel. And if you dialed in with a traditional phone, please select the phone call option. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box in the control panel and they will be addressed at the end of the discussion. And now, without further ado, please welcome our moderator for the session, Kathleen Cieslak. Kathleen is a community engagement and public consultation professional with a focus on Indigenous relations management, stakeholder management, real estate and land asset management. Described as an engaged listener who looks for mutually beneficial opportunities to drive innovation and effective engagement solutions, Kathleen has more than 14 years experience in community engagement. Kathleen enjoys making connections with the individuals she meets and the opportunity to learn about new and diverse perspectives. Thanks, Cassandra. I really appreciate the introduction. Um, before we, we jump into our, our talk today, I also just wanted to welcome everybody and let everyone know that this presentation is being recorded and it will be available on the diversity and inclusion section of the CIM website in a couple of weeks. So if you miss anything or you want to listen to this again, um, you'll be able to, to find it there. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Lana Eagle. Um, Lana is an Indigenous relations strategist and social innovator, advising companies on how to better engage and work with Indigenous communities and to find a path forward through a reconciliation framework. Her background is in banking, economic development, wealth management, mineral exploration, and mining. Lana is a trailblazer. Being the first Indigenous woman to serve on the Board of Directors for the AME and one of the first to chair a junior mineral exploration company, she is a member of the Board of Geoscience BC and a Program Advisory Committee member for Mining and Mineral Exploration of BCIT. Lana is a member of Whitecap Dakota First Nation in Saskatchewan. Welcome, Lana. So excited to have you here today. My pleasure, and it's really great being here. I thought I wasn't going to be nervous, but I am just a little nervous this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a new uh, sort of way of, of expressing um, what I have to say, but I, I couldn't be happier to talk to you, Kathleen, this morning. First, I'd like to acknowledge that I am living and working out of the city of Campbell River, which is located on the traditional territories of the Wee Kai and Wee Wee Kam people. And, um, it's lovely here on Vancouver Island. If you're anywhere else in Canada, I'm sure it's lovely too, but it's really lovely here. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great. I, I have to agree, uh, moving into the virtual, I know we've been doing this for a year, but I think the traditional territorial acknowledgements is something that I'm enjoying the most in the virtual world because we're all in different places and hearing about them is, is amazing. Today I'm in Mississauga and I'm on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, so it's so neat that we can we can share that. Um, and before we really launch in today's conversation, I actually wanted to ask you about territorial acknowledgements. Do you have any advice for, for people as they create the, the land acknowledgements? We're seeing them more and more. You know, how do you research it? Does it have to be an Indigenous person that provides them? 
any advice and guidance for people who are who are kind of venturing in and, and wanting to do this appropriately? Well, I don't think it has to be an Indigenous person that provides that acknowledgement. But mm -hmm. where, whoever you're acknowledging, whatever land you're acknowledging, I think there has to be um, a genuineness to it. It's not just a checklist, you know, that we're going to do to make ourselves look look like we're a good company, but it really is heartfelt. And I think once we start to um, perhaps go out in the field more or be on site um, at, at a project, we begin to understand the land more, maybe not to the extent as Indigenous people might understand what the land is to them, but we certainly have a better uh, feel for, for what it really means. And I think in that moment when we do acknowledge the land, you know, especially if we're calling in from the Mississaugas or the Torontos or the Vancouver's or even the Campbell Rivers of the world. It just kind of, um, I feel it, 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 um, it brings me to a place where I feel grounded. And I think, and it's also a sense of respect too. Yeah. Respecting the people whose land, you know, we are on. And, um, you know, many will um, have a lot to say about it, but that's not necessary. I think it's just really important to be genuine genuine in your heart. I like that. I like that. I have to say I helped um, my child's uh, dance studio put together an acknowledgement the other day and in, in their research they found out about the local um, communities and the types of dances they did and they actually shared that in their territorial acknowledgement and I thought that made it very very genuine. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's wonderful. Thank you for that advice. Um, so let's launch into today's discussion and, and let's start by setting the stage quite broadly. Let's, let's start big and we'll, we'll, we'll narrow it down as we go through this. So would you mind starting us out by explaining what you're seeing in our country today when it comes to acknowledging our shared history with Indigenous people? I, I know that's a big question, but what are, wh where are we starting? What are you seeing today um, as it pertains to this, this shared history and, and what we're learning and, and where, we're, where we're at? Well, you know, I think that I'm seeing all kinds of reactions. I think, you know, there's some very negative reactions and some very positive reactions. And, and sometimes I think it's just knowing that these reactions are happening and people are, are um, challenged by this in terms of what they believe and how they perceive a group of people um, and how that group of people feel they're being perceived by the Canadian society. I think those are all really a good thing because, because it's showing that people are actually really looking inward to see what their thoughts are. So we hear the negative stories and you know we hear the media talking about um, things like racism and, and um, problems that exist maybe perhaps with our RCMP or with the fishermen on the East Coast. And pardon me for lumping, you know, categorically people into, into these and saying, I'm not saying you're all racist, but I think we start to um, see and understand from our exposure to what we see on social media, that these, these kinds of things are taking place. And mm -hmm. yet when I am talking to um, colleagues in the industry, and when I say the industry, I mean the mining industry, whether it's mining or mineral exploration, there seems to be a real wanting to understand more. And especially when I, you know, when people like your age group who went to school, never, never heard a thing about our Canadian history, the Canadian Indigenous history. And now they're hearing it for the first time and, and their reactions, um, you know, they're, they're, I think overall saddened that we have such a dark history and, mm -hmm. and concerned about the role that maybe their family um, played in all of this, you know, to where we are today. But there is that hunger to find out more and to learn more and to be a better person. So just to tell you a little story, this past summer, you know, I think we really were dealing with a lot of different things as a society. And certainly, you know, understanding racism and, and um, Black Lives Matter became a real movement and um, along with that, I think the Indigenous Lives Matter started to gain momentum as well. And um, I remember receiving a message from a friend of mine who is um, younger and she's a geo. And she said, oh my God, I didn't even know I was a racist. And I found that so refreshing because, because I think as, as she began to understand colonialism and systemic racism, what it is, 
she realized that, that there were things that she started to believe and readily accept as the norm. And so that's what she was basing all of her um, understanding and reactions towards a group of people on. But, but what, an, what a, um, an opening of her mind. And uh, now she's working in building indigenous relations as a geologist here in BC. And I think it's really remarkable to, to be able to say, I am this, I didn't even realize it. And then to start to make changes in terms of how, how you are. And those yeah. changes aren't always easy, as we well know. I Yes, I, I, I agree. And, and I think sometimes it's overcoming, you know, that that initial reaction of shame in our history to to understanding that we can't change it, but we can definitely grow from it and learn from it and, and move forward. But it, it does all start with that that recognition. Uh, what a great story. Um, so I, I heard you use the words um, colonialism and systematic uh, racism when you when you were talking right now. And I think for some of us, you know, you think of those terms as like old terms, like that that used to happen. Um, colonialism, systemic racism, you know, th that was in the past. We're not there anymore. But I think it's very much, as you were saying, informing our current relationships. I think it's probably still there. Can you talk a little bit about how colonialism and, and systemic racism is, is, you know, still informing what we're seeing today and what Indigenous people are experiencing today and, and, and what we're trying to propel forward through. I, I think it's really important to understand those concepts and, and how they're still relevant. So colonialism is, in very simple terms, is a subjugation of a people so that you can be at an, at an advantage, you know, to um, an economic advantage, you know, and certainly our history in Canada as resource um, developers and operators, we have a history of colonialism. I mean, this is how we began to access land by putting indigenous people on reserves and by accessing the wealth beneath the ground. And so for, so for centuries, indigenous people have seen the wealth depart from their land. And now, now they're starting to want to have more of an opportunity, more than, and I'm going to say this um, without casting any sort of um, criticism on any company, but it's more than training and jobs. It, it's, we're starting to hear um, communities talk about, you know, having um, ownership in the project. And, you know, it's arguable that, you know, procurement is a type of ownership or at least moving towards that ownership uh, level as opposed to just um, training and jobs. So, and we'll talk about that more when we talk about inclusivity, but um, colonialism is, a, is an attitude, you know, that um, a mind can just go in anywhere and start to um, um, have an, um, an impact on the land environmentally, have an impact on the people socially, and, you know, definitely have an economic impact for themselves. And so that playing field, there is a desire to level that playing field. When I talk about systemic racism, it's about accepting things as a normal practice. So when we look at the Indian Act in Canada, which those of us who are Indigenous are, are governed under the Indian Act, we essentially are wards of the state. So when we begin to accept that and, you know, oh, well, don't, don't worry about them because they, they live on a reserve and they get all their housing paid for and, you know, and, and in, in fact, you know, the truth becomes amplified. Um, you know, I lived in a small town, BC, for a long time, even smaller than Campbell River. North of here, there's a town called Port Hardy. And I was surprised, shocked even sometimes at some of the attitudes that prevailed um, that I had to speak out against. And I never, ever thought that I would be that person. But it, it became more of an education, you know, especially when um, people were, you know, thinking that all natives got free housing, all natives got free gas. The furthest thing from the truth, it's not free housing, it's social housing, and there's a big difference. And to understand how all of that works and, and, and how people have to still pay for a place to live, um, it, it actually, the education helped to, to change people's attitudes towards contributing, perhaps they 
donation, you know, when a donation was asked for. So it's about understanding how things work. But if we choose not to understand, those systemic racism attitudes will continue to prevail and to color our way of thinking about situations. Um, so I think it's incumbent upon us. And when I say us, I, I, I kind of move back and forth, you know, uh, as, a, as a Canadian growing up in small town Saskatchewan and as an Indigenous person, it's up to us as Canadians to become um, educated and better informed about the, um, the issues and the plight of Indigenous people since we became wards of the state and, and what that means and how it's affected us socially so that we see um, rampant poverty and um, you know when we go to certain areas you know whether it's um, North Edmonton or North Winnipeg and we see you know people living in the downtown east side barely above a poverty level where there's homelessness and a lot of other social issues and, and we can look at that and say oh thank god I don't have to live like that thank god I have a job you know I'm just I'm just so much better off I but but it's not it's not really it shouldn't be that way but but we put ourselves that way because that is the human thing to do and to start to become educated I think you know is is what we're starting to see and, I, and that brings warmth to my heart that that people are wanting to understand better so that they can be more informed so they can be less critical and perhaps more helpful no, that that's great. Um, that's great to understand because I I do I, I I agree with you that education and understanding and and taking that extra step to know you know why why is that person you know living barely above the poverty line and what contributes to that and and understand the the role history plays in that. Do you think you know um, just staying broad here for for a moment um, and again around that colonialism and systemic racism, if people were interested in understanding how that's you know, playing out more, you know, broadly across Canada, would you recommend the Truth and Reconciliation Commission findings? Do you think that really, to me, that highlights a lot of, um, you know, how colonialism and, and racism is, is playing out and maybe the missing murdered Indigenous women inquiry findings? Because I, I think that really counters that stereotype that you were talking about, the idea of somehow all Indigenous people get free housing or education, understanding that there's an entire, one, that's not true, but also, there's an entire flip side that, that colonialism has created, you know, a very dangerous situation um, for, for, for Indigenous people in, in some ways. Do you, do you want to speak to those reports at all or those findings and, and just how important they are in, in informing our knowledge? Sure. I can tell you that both reports are very, very lengthy. So it's not, yeah. it's not a quick read. <laughs> but, but, you know, even just to delve into the, to the summary of, that, of the, both reports is a start. I think it opens your eyes, especially when you start to hear stories, stories of people that endured a residential schools and, and all of the social impact that it's had to their families for generations. And, um, you know, I'm very fortunate um, in terms of my family, but my father did attend residential school and my mom for a very, very brief time in her life. But, you know, those, those, in, those social impacts continue to perpetuate generation after generation. So what we're seeing now in homes that um, that perhaps, you know, it was two generations ago or a generation ago where people were, you know, in residential schools. We have um, children that were brought up in residential schools, and I use that term very loosely brought up, but they lacked having a family. They lacked the love of a parent. They lack the ability to speak their language and communicate with their siblings so that it impacted them for their entire lives. We, I know when we become unruly teenagers, <laughs> we may not appreciate our parents so much, but they have a huge impact on our lives. And I think that when you take that away from a child and then they get, they get put back onto the reserve, there are so many social issues that, that, um, they are trying to deal with. Now I have two very um, inspiring colleagues that were, you know, in residential school. One had to start going when he was in kindergarten, so age five, and he didn't actually see his mother until he was 17. Now when you meet this guy, 
at a conference, at a mining conference, they're on the street, biggest smile ever, just so happy. So, you know, life is great. And he doesn't carry that, the scars of residential school with him. But, you know, it took a certain amount of, um, of inner strength to rise above that. Another friend of mine from the opposite end of the country, very highly respected group of indigenous people, one of the Quebec Cree. Um, you know, when he presents himself in public, you see a very strong person. And then one day we were out for, for breakfast and I ordered oatmeal. And he just, he just went really sad and really quiet. And he said, you know, I haven't been able to eat oatmeal since residential school because that's all they fed us. And then I heard the story. And it, it saddens me that people still carry some of that hurt with them, but we can't sit here in our chairs and say, well, you know, they should just get over it because it's not about just getting over it. It's affected them largely. And then they carry that to the next generation and the next generation carries that to the next generation. So the hurt that's been, been done to indigenous people who were in residential school continues to perpetuate generation after generation. It's there. And um, that's kind of the social fabric that, that mining companies have to, to work through and to overcome and to help people overcome. So it's, it's a huge challenge. It's a huge social challenge as much as it is an environmental challenge, as much as it is an economic challenge. So I think understanding that is really important. Thank you for sharing that, that Lana. Um, I've had the privilege of somebody sharing their story of residential school experience with me before, and it's something that I can't imagine caring personally and, and hearing it um, is something I carry with me as well. And I, I agree that intergenerational trauma has to be understood and how that plays in to you know, how we move forward and reconciliation. Um, so thank you, you know, for, for starting that conversation. And what I'm wondering is, you, you know, you really talk about that loss of culture and, and that opportunity to teach and learn from your parents, especially through something like residential schools. So uh, how do you think teaching and learning about Indigenous culture now really helps with the spirit of reconciliation? Because we're starting to hear more about that, that reconciliation, that, that looking forward. What role do you think, you know, the teaching and learning about Indigenous culture plays in that? Well, I think, you know, a couple of thoughts come to mind. First of all, um, we talk about the Western worldview. We talk about Western science. And on the other side, we talk about the Indigenous worldview and traditional knowledge. So it's a different kind of perspective. And I think that's what needs to be learned. And that's what needs to be understood. And culture provides that avenue. Language provides that avenue. So, so you know, it's not that you know um, a couple of um, Indian songs. It's not that you've danced a couple of times, but it's understanding the perspective and why people think a certain way. So when we look at, you know, the future of mining, it really is the future because, you know, often you've heard of seven generations Well, we're looking to the future of our children, our children's children and so on. And, and, and mining sometimes is just, you know, the life of mine based on what's in the ground and how we get it out of the ground. And it, life of mine may not be into the next seven generations, or it could be if you look at Highland Valley Copper here in BC, they're looking at extending the life of mine. And if you ever fly over that mine, it's huge. The pit is enormous. And they have been there for generations and generations and will likely continue on. But, but in that, you know, if there had been at the very beginning of that mine, you know, when they were exploring um, the same kind of environment we live in today, where we are um, wanting to build and engage relationships with indigenous communities, we would have been probably considering ourselves now with a seventh generation, but but here we are today. There's all kinds of minds, you know, in different stages, and we know that because um, you know world um, gold and copper prices are high, we also know that Canada recently announced the critical minerals list, 31 different minerals that are ex you know extremely important to the future of Canada and its mining industry. 
So with armed with that, you know, we are looking at uh, potential mind development, perhaps when we wouldn't even have considered it 10 years ago in a particular area. But in that area is most likely the traditional lands of a community. And so those kind of relationships, I would be surprised, you know, if nothing had been done so far to build a relationship. But be that as it may, there still are places like that where, you know, industry has gone on, determined that they're going to do what they need to do, but still haven't um, built a relationship with the local communities. The reverse of that is, is some understand the importance of that and have already gone in and had those initial discussions. So then it becomes a whole thing about, you know, how those relationships are built, but understanding, you know, if you understand the history of Canada's Indigenous people, there may not be a level of trust right from the beginning. So building that relationship is really about building trust. You know, be becoming more knowledgeable about culture is really about understanding the other worldview, the Indigenous worldview and perspective on our industry, on our future, on their future and what the land means to them. Interesting. I really, I really like, you know, what you're suggesting there, that interconnectedness between the seven generations perspective and that long-term view and the life cycle of a mind and, and, you know, extending those things to not be um, adversaries, but to, to work in parallel to one another. That's, that's really, I think, what learning about the, the culture uh, can, can provide. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit more? Because I mean, I think you've, you've done a great job talking about the importance of us understanding broadly the, the history and, and learning about indigenous culture and history from a business perspective. Do you think there's anything specifically businesses really need to grasp and learn about indigenous culture um, as they, they try and create these relationships going, going forward? Well, I think one thing to keep in mind is that across Canada, there's over 660 First Nation communities, mm -hmm. some all from different language groups, all with different histories, different different um, stories of creation. And, and we are different from one another. I am Sioux, I am from the prairies. Um, I am different from colleagues who are Quebec Northern Cree. I'm different from colleagues who may be um, uh, Shequepam from the interior of BC. We're all different. So if you have had a wonderful experience working in a location somewhere in Canada, you can't expect that you're going to move into another location and instantly have that same rapport because it does require some uh, fact finding, trying to learn the history, trying to understand what the issues are. And um, some of that will come, you know, through modern day techniques like researching on the internet. Others will come through um, talking to um, other companies, other friends, colleagues who have worked in the area and worked with, you know, the, the, the community. And other times it, it will just be starting to have those um, face to face relationships with people. Now we, we're in a different time today. We're still in the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, uh, many communities shut themselves off from the world and, um, and, and created um, strict um, regulations on who could enter into their territory and not enter into their territory. So even if um, companies were moving along in that you know, soon to be constructing phase, they still you know, had to deal with, well, if we go into the community, we're going to have to quarantine for two weeks and on and on. So how does that how does that affect our bottom line and maybe do we just put off a project for a few months and, and start to re-enter when things are better so so that building relationships is, has been maybe a little bit more challenging as we all are you know trying to build relationships through zoom and other platforms you know we we are challenged from time to time on how that happens and um and so, you know, it's arguable, can we actually build a relationship this way? But I think, you know, for this time that we're in, we really have to take the lead from the Indigenous community because they're the ones that are protecting their land, their people, you know, from um, a COVID virus outbreak. But we know that these things happen and they have done that in different parts of Canada. They have, the COVID virus has found a way in. And so, um, 
I think, you know, we have to be respectful of all of that and we have to be able to adjust our plans, you know, in light of everything that's going on today. Absolutely. I think you touched on some really important parts there. The idea that the one size fits all approach uh, doesn't work, I think, is is something um, I really hope people take away from this, that, you know, building trust is not built on assumptions or an idea of, you know, this this uni one type of indigenous person it, it's it's through those relationships and um and you started touching on covid nineteen there because i I agree with you I think um you know indigenous populations and businesses have disproportionately felt the impacts of, of COVID-19 and had to react in different ways um and you and you started talking about the way business needs to be patient to understand that the capacity to re-engage at the speed at which we may want to uh, from a business perspective might be limited um so I, I i i won't i won't harp on that but i think that's a really good point to make that there, there needs to be patience built in into this and into this time and and again to loop back that idea of the history you're talking about that you know indigenous communities look a certain way because of history and we have to respect that um you know as as we start to open up from this pandemic i'm i'm going to ask you quickly what uh, just to move a little bit more into the mining um side of the house here what what do you think the mining industry can do to create a more inclusive work environment for indigenous people you know once we move through this covid um time <laughs> hopefully soon um but, but what is it that that creates a more inclusive work environment for somebody coming in well, um, yesterday I had an opportunity to listen to my colleague Jamila Cruz um, mm -hmm. talk about um, inclusion. And I wrote down what one of the things that she said is that inclusion is an environment of respect. So really, you know, it is about respecting where someone is coming from, what they believe, you know, their approach to work. But, but it we just can't put the onus on that entry level person that they're going to carry all of this and do all of this for building that relationship between a nation and industry so it has to start somewhere and i think you know at the very at the very outset is that relationship between the manager of the mine and the local chief and then we, we continue to build to build relationships so one good example that I want to reference is uh, the new gold operation in BC at New Afton. And when they signed the agreement with the two First Nations, you know, there was, how are we going to implement this agreement? That became the next talk because relationship building is not just that one moment when you achieve your social license to operate or you get your permitting and phew, now we're done talking to all these people, you know, we have an agreement, they should be happy. It isn't, it, it is only the beginning and New Gold chose to believe that in order to, to move forward, we have to figure out how we're going to implement this relationship, implement this agreement. And so with that, they formed the Joint Implementation Committee, which um, sat on that committee, um, Indigenous people and Mines people. And they were able to create a place where if anyone had a complaint, you know, perhaps uh, an Indigenous community member in, in terms of, you know, their, their experience at work, or perhaps someone that was um, had a business and their business was procured to do a certain type of work, any kind of complaint that people felt that there was a complaint could be brought to this joint implementation committee. And from there, they dealt with these challenges. And eventually, if, it, if they could not be dealt with, um, you know, it, it, the problem continued to rise until it got to the um, to the CEO of the company and the chief of, of the uh, First Nations. And so so then they, um, you know, came up with some sort of way to deal with it. And then it worked its way back down to, to the to the grassroots level. So what that did is it, it, it for people felt like they were it was a fair process. And 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 so this is the thing if, if mining companies think that once they've achieved what they're looking for which is a permit to operate that their job is done with indigenous communities it's not and certainly today i look at you know the jurisdiction of british columbia where back in december of 2019 it feels like a lifetime ago 
maybe it was a lifetime ago, <laughs> we had the, the DRIPA signed, which is the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People Act. And um, it was um, between First Nations government and the province of BC. And as signatories, the province of BC has, um, has committed to changing all of their acts, all of their laws to align and reflect um, the rights of Indigenous people in BC. So that could be the wording, that could be you know, the process. And, and in that whole list of laws is our Minds Act. So, so these changes are forthcoming now. Unfortunately, the pandemic has come, so it, it kind of slowed that process down. But for Indigenous people, what this means is our human rights are finally being acknowledged. Now that sounds like, wow, they weren't acknowledged before. How can that be? You're Canadians, but it's true. As the boards of the state, our human rights weren't acknowledged. So this act is bigger than natural resource development. It's about our children. It's about education. It's about health. It's about every part of life that has not been recognized formally by the governments um, until now. And you know there are um, people that are real, really supportive of this, and of course there are the, the naysayers. And um, I can always tell a naysayer because the first thing they'll say is, "Well, this just gives Indigenous people a veto." But really, it doesn't, because when I listen to our um, regional chief, Chief Terry T.G., he talks then about the importance of early engagement, deep, meaningful engagement. So it is getting in there early. So to answer your question, if we haven't had those conversations with Indigenous people in terms of where they want to go, understand that training and jobs are not the only thing that um, that people want, that Indigenous people want to negotiate in an agreement. It's a part of it, but not everything. And then what are we doing to make that uh, a fair and equitable um, opportunity for Indigenous people? And um, in that, you know, there, the, as we understand the history, as we build relationships, as we build trust, we begin to understand more and more and more how this can work effectively. And then we also have to do the tough task of how does this work with it, you know, when we're looking at a workforce that may be um, living in camp or, you know, maybe in a nearby town, they're, they're, they're being bussed in. But, you know, if I'm not Indigenous, and I have a certain um, certain uh, rules and regulations that I have to work by. How does that differ from this person over here who is Indigenous, who lives in the community? And there are things that may come up that are culturally important to the Indigenous community. So how is that negotiated into um, into someone's um, work? Um, what is expected of them at work? So I think that it's a long and a deep and a meaningful engagement that's going to bring some of the answers to these questions that people often ask. And, yeah. you know, and, and, I, and just to sort of uh, finish that, when somebody, um, I always get a kick out of it, you know, and, and not even, I won't use a mining company as an example, but, you know, I do a lot of volunteer work on a lot of different boards. And when somebody says, oh, well, we tried that in 1984 and it didn't work. <laughs> you know, just, just to just to shut people down, I think we have to be willing to try things again and again and find a way to make things work. But if we're not engaging and we're not talking and we're not learning and we're not listening, we may never find out what those things are to make mm -hmm. something work. Yeah, yeah, I think um, those are such wonderful points. Just to make because it's the listening that really gets you to those new places, to those innovative thoughts and, and an understanding. Um, I can just think of, of myself a number of years ago, I was working on a project and, and one of the, the pieces we really had to listen to wasn't something was even in our radar and it was a, around bereavement leave. And it was the idea that a number of our indigenous employees um, had family that was a lot further away and their definition of family was very different. And the bereavement standards in the company at the time didn't take that into account and they needed to be 
altered to allow that employee to fully participate at work, um, but also take the time they needed to acknowledge, you know, what was going on at home. And, and it was only through listening and them articulating that, that and asking the right questions that we were able to arrive at those, those places and those changes. So, you know, I, I really echo what you say that listening is such an important component to engagement, like active listening. Um, and so I think, you know, as we as we start to, to come to the, the end of our conversation here, and, and we still have a little bit of time, but I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about inclusion from a personal perspective in terms of, you know, sometimes it's difficult to grasp, you know, or fully understand what inclusion might look like, especially if you're somebody who has never really experienced it, um, not being included. What what are your suggestions for us individually in the workplace that we can do um, to, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis that that helps with a more inclusive environment? Well, it's interesting that you even that you asked that question. Um, I think up until recently, I would define I would have defined inclusion um, as an environment that makes me feel like I belong. But I realize that when I do that, I'm expecting other people to make me feel like I belong. So now when I think about inclusion, um, it was kind of one of those aha moments. It's what, what can I do to make you feel like you belong? And really what that does is it empowers me to be that kind of person that is inclusive. Um, and I think that's what I would say to, to people. You know, um, yesterday, Jamila could have, couldn't have said it better, you know, in terms of, confining this whole idea of inclusion to the HR department. So suddenly they become responsible for all of this. But really it's about each one of us in our daily lives, you know, in, in the work, in the place that we work, you know, in the clubs that we belong to, you know, with our families, whatever we do with our time, that we are out there making other people feel like they belong. And you know, one thing that doesn't have to be put into a policy or um, put into, um, you know, how we're going to behave with one another. It's a whole thing about smiling. You know, I can smile at somebody. It costs the company nothing. It costs me nothing, but it, it's, it's about being friendly and wanting to be friendly and being genuine. And it's amazing the power of a smile. So it really is this internal question. What can I do to make somebody feel more included? I love that. Um, I'm forever smiling. So that's that's great news. <laughs> um, all right. So what I'm going to do to uh, Lana is, first of all, I, I want to say thank you. Um, I've learned a lot. And some of the things I'm taking away myself are, you know, it all really starts with education. And, and I think no matter where you are on that spectrum, education is important. Um, and it's okay not to know and embrace that and, and figure out how and where you are and, and how to continue to grow your knowledge. Um, so education is, is where we need to start. And, and being open to that learning um, and, and to your own attitudes and to your own biases and accepting where you are. Um, that hard conversations happen and, and that's okay. They're healthy if you learn to move through them. Um, and and inclusion comes from within us i just took that away from from you is you know it's not always about um it's about empowering other people to to include us and um i, I think that's such a great perspective to have and it, it's a little bit different than the way i had been thinking about it and um most of all i'm going to say the one size fits all approach doesn't work that that trust is built over time it's built through genuine connection it's built through conversation and and a real interest in listening so i'm, I'm taking all of that away is there anything that i've missed there that you you want our listeners to to really walk away with as well no i think that you captured it all really well kathleen good job at listening <laughs> oh thank you <laughs> i really right. enjoyed being here today with you thank you for um for spending this time with me and uh, thank you to CIM for having us um, contribute to the uh, to the webinar series. Thank oh, you. No problem. So I have a couple questions. Um, we probably aren't going to get through them all. Um, so if, if I don't ask your question, please know that, that they will be answered after. Um, so the first one's a simple one. It takes us right back up to the beginning of our, our conversation around land acknowledgements. But 
um, somebody asked, how do we find out whose land we're on? Is, uh, is a Google search appropriate, Lana, on this one? Oh, yeah. The Google search. <laughs> you can find anything on Google, I'm finding. Uh, no. um, but, you know, yeah, it's, um, it's just asking the question. Uh, land acknowledgement for Campbell River, for instance, or land acknowledgement for Mississauga. And it should be it should be in there. If it's not in there, then I would suggest phoning your local chamber of commerce. They may get asked that question from time to time, but it should be you should be able to find it on Google. Perfect. And something I, I'm going to add to that question is if you make a mistake, if you leave a, a First Nation territory out and someone teaches you after, is that OK? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all make mistakes. And I think I think. It's, it's a good um, learning place to be in if you are corrected. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can count on more than 10 fingers uh, how many times I've been corrected in my lifetime, but um, it's, it's being able to learn from that and um, being gracious that someone pointed it out. Perfect, thank you. Um, here's another question. It's around procurement. Someone who's new to the mining um, world and industry, and they said, what does procurement mean? It, it was mentioned in the context of moving towards um, a part of ownership. Sorry, I'm learning how to use the software as well um, on a project. I think if I'm if I'm going to sum that question up properly, it's they're trying to understand what you were meaning in terms of the role of procurement in relation to ownership, maybe how they're different, how they're the same. Yeah, I think all I meant was on a scale, like if you were looking at ownership being one end and training and jobs being an, another end, procurement, you know, on that scale in between might seem closer to ownership than, let's say, training and jobs. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was referring to. I wasn't saying that procurement is um, um, ownership. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Okay. It does to me. It does to me. And hopefully it does to um, the individual who asked it. And if, if it didn't, I I, I, um, I would encourage that individual to post another question and uh, we'll answer it after if you need more clarity. Um, so another question here is it was mentioned that, um, sorry, when a person spoke up and articulated an issue um, that they were able to push for change, but not everybody is able to articulate um, themselves or, or they feel uncomfortable articulating themselves and learning business speak. Um, how do you how do you think we can help people, uh, especially and maybe this is in the context of the inclusion and Indigenous people, express what their experience, express what they're feeling and feeling safe to help them, you know, help figure that out within the business context. Not everyone's comfortable to say, I've experienced this. I think it's it's first of all creating a safe environment. Mm. So, um, you know, I think you know a public meeting where everyone is on display is probably not the safest environment because while there may not be uh, a real unsafety, people just don't want to be up there, you know, in front of everybody expressing something. Mm. And I think I think that it can be um, not healthy. But you know, maybe there is a way that um, that people can. I think it's building that level of trust first that that you are open to hearing uh, comments or suggestions or expressions of um, of challenge and then and then a way a process that those um, those um, concerns or issues they want to raise can be done in a format where they can trust that if they put that let's say on um, in a form of a letter or you know email that it's going to be dealt with. And I guess timeliness is another thing. So if somebody um, sends, um, articulates uh, a problem and it's February, you know, they would want to be, hear be hearing back within a reasonable time period that this is how we're going to deal with it. So um, March might be, you know, a quick turnaround, I think is important. Yeah. If something is, is submitted in February and now it's June and you think, oh, I guess we've got to deal with that problem sooner or later, maybe it'll just go away. <laughs> uh, you know, those are probably not healthy ways to deal with things. I think no. building trust and creating a safe environment uh, and also a timeliness of um, answering any questions that might come. 
Perfect. I'm going to ask you one last question here. Um, it might be a bit big, but we'll see if we can get it in a couple minutes. Um, the, the, the individual is asking, are you able to provide us with a specific example or project in Canada that e exemplifies effective engagement with a local Indigenous community? And, and what did it look like in that particular case? Who's doing well, it right? <laughs> well, I think, I think, um, I, mean, I just recently heard the story. Um, it was very, very interesting. And um, it's the, the story of Sabina Silver and Gold up in Nunavut and looking at the development of their mine. Um, I've forgotten the name. I think it's Black Water or Black Rock. It's something like that. Um, anyway, they wanted to build this mine and their original plan had the tailings pond located on indigenous land. And um, you know, when they went through the environmental assessment review process, it was, it was not permitted. So they had to go back and, and rework everything and in that process engage with the communities several times, hundreds of times. And finally, um, they came up with a plan to put the tailings pond in a different area, which was on Crown land, not Indigenous land. And, um, you know, the Crown was happy with it. I don't know how happy you can be with a tailings <laughs> management plan, but they were they were fine with it. And uh, so then they were permitted, but that whole process from the original uh, no to a yes took 10 years. And that was 10 years of working with the community, answering their questions. Um, and there were people attending the meetings who could not speak English. And so, you know, they had to work through an interpreter and um, find ways to, to address any environmental concerns that were brought up by, um, the local people so so they are to me that speaks well you know about patience about knowing that um things take time and maybe maybe they didn't you know set it out in a gantt chart maybe originally they did but <laughs> you know they weren't saying well you know we're going to get this approval in place in three months i mean yeah. oftentimes that's how i get asked if, if i can work on a project is we need these um, permits um signed by the end of the summer can you do it yeah, and it's like, wow, like it's that was that's an old approach, but it's still out there, right? So I think I think yeah. it's it's understanding that time is it, it's a whole different perspective to Indigenous people. Yes, yes, I. It's funny. I think you and I may have a very similar experience there, where, I, you know, people are often asking or interested in, you know, what what was what was that lesson learned? What was the one thing that made it successful? And I can never tell you it was one action, um, or or one particular program. It was time. It was it was time. And that's really. Would you agree? That's kind of the difference in my brain between engagement and consultation. Engagement is that that idea of it's it, you start early and and there's time built into it where the consultation and the legal framework is is much more confined um to that permitting process okay yeah, that's I, yeah i think oh, the other way to look at it too is engagement yes it takes time but probably the dollar per hour is less than consultation because i have lawyers involved <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yes, I totally agree. I totally agree. Oh, and there's Cassandra. <laughs> I'll let you jump in. It's yeah, it's been an amazing discussion. Thank you, Lana, and thank you, Kathleen. It's uh, for myself listening. It, I, I I found it personally very very insightful and and powerful. So um, I, I suspect I'm not just speaking on my own behalf. But on behalf of our audience, I, I really want to express my appreciation and, and gratitude for your, your time and energy towards this today. And it does also mean, you know, our time is, is at an end. So I know there's some additional questions in the chat that we won't have time to cover in the session this morning or or today depending on your time zone but they will be shared with Lana and we will be able to put forward that response at a later date. I also just want to remind people, we do have our next webinar in this series scheduled for April 15th. It will be a panel discussion on Indigenous women at work. And so we've added a link in the chat. If you'd like to register, you can just click on that now and, and follow it through.
Um, and to, to wrap up, just once again, thank you, Lana. Thank you, Kathleen. And thank you to everyone else on the line. I, I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you have a, a good rest of your day.